Good day, eCognition fans. This is uh, Keith Peterson, the product manager for our Trimble eCognition software. And I'd like to welcome you to our webinar today. Uh, this webinar is called eCognition for Beginners. And I think we're going to give you a very nice uh, overview, first of all, of what the, uh, the software is capable of. And then we'll move right into an exercise uh, within eCognition Developer. And uh, you'll see how this all works hands-on with uh, our eCognition trainer, who is my guest today, Matthias Stengel. So first of all, overview of what we will cover in today's webinar, brief introduction, what is eCognition, some of its unique unique features for those of you that are not yet familiar with our software or maybe have forgotten what uh, certain features are available within the software. We'll just do a quick overview. Uh, then we'll jump right into our exercise on automated forest canopy extraction, looking at a fully automated workflow to extract uh, forest canopy uh, data uh, information from, from imagery and, uh, and point clouds in, in this case. And then uh, we will wrap things up uh, with an overview of what type of e-cognition uh, resources are available uh, to you uh, in, in the World Wide Web and, and, and beyond. And uh, just to, to reassure you on how this, this webinar is working, everybody is in a listen-only mode. If you have questions, you can submit these at any time during the webinar uh, via the questions field. And uh, don't worry, this webinar is being recorded. So if you need to jump out at some point and, and miss a section, the recording will be made available shortly after we conclude the webinar in the uh, Trimble Geospatial uh, Webinar Archive. So let's get right into the introduction uh, to eCognition. What is, is the eCognition software? First of all, we are going to be working with the eCognition suite package, specifically using the developer uh, software. And uh, what we provide with eCognition developer is an advanced analysis software and development environment. We think of this developer as a development platform. And this is uh, primarily available for geospatial applications. What developer does is it allows our users to create their own feature extraction and or change detection solutions to, to transform those uh, geospatial data sets, whether it's going to be optical imagery, SAR imagery, or maybe elevation data as a, in a raster format, point cloud format, what have you, transform these uh, these very nice data products into geospatial information. And by that, I mean extracting out the, the information and putting it into, say, a land cover map, an impervious surface map, or maybe even looking at specific objects uh, within our imagery, such as individual trees, manhole covers, something of this nature. Um, this, is, uh, this is what this software provides the tools to do. You can think of it as a toolbox for creating image analysis workflows and what we then call rule sets. The use cases, just uh, brief here. Uh, we're about extracting information, but also about updating information. So we can take uh, information from our imagery, create, for example, a vector file that then flows into our GIS workflows. But we can also take an existing GIS file, say a vector data set, and update that based on the newest flights that we have. So we're constantly getting new information. New satellites are, are always flying. We're getting imagery every day now from various uh, satellite constellations. We have uh, aerial campaigns going up. We have UAVs. So we're creating lots and lots of image information. And sometimes that outpaces uh, the, 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 the vector information that we have. So we can don't have to create everything from scratch. We can update those existing vector files based on the new uh, data and information that we have in our in our imagery. That being said, some of the unique features that uh, are available within eCognition Developer, uh, primarily we focus on what we call data fusion. What we mean by that is that we have the power to load not only raster data, so your imagery in eCognition, but we can combine that in a project with vector data sets, shape files, file geodatabases, for example, and we can also combine everything with point cloud data, whether that's a photogrammetric point cloud or a LIDAR point cloud. Uh, that is, the source is, uh, is irrelevant, just needs to be a uh, LAS file or an LAZ file. And we can take these different data sources and we can fuse them together. We can combine them within a single project environment with an eCognition developer and then allow these data sets to communicate with one another to create our 
our class descriptions, how we want to describe an object as it appears on the ground. And this allows us to create a much more robust uh, classification result. That being said, I would like to move on to our exercise. Like I said, we're going to keep this introduction brief and really concentrate today on uh, this exercise within the software. The software that we will be using again is the eCognition developer software. When we are going to create a rule set today for automated forest canopy mapping. And I will now hand over the microphone to our trainer here in house in Munich. And that is Matthias Stengel. Matthias, please uh, let the uh, viewers know what our goals are today, and then we can uh, jump right into uh, working in developer. All right. I, hello, everyone. Thank you, Keith, for the introduction. I hope you can see my screen now. Um, the goal of today is that we're going to do an automatic extraction of forest canopies with crown height classes. So we first go, we're going to extract forest and then we're going to go into the forest class and discriminate between dif different forest heights. And the data sets that we have is we have an aerial image, so RGB, and also a near infrared image. Um, and additionally, we have a LiDAR point cloud data set, which we're going to also include in our analysis. So um, I already created a project that you hopefully see now. So I loaded the data. You see, it's, it's actually a small subset. Um, uh, you don't see it yet. Now you see it, I guess. So I loaded the data into eCognition Developer. And here you see RGB image of the subset that I, I created. And we also have a point cloud. Just going to display it for you. And we're going to use this information. We're going to fuse these two data sets together to extract our forested area. And I'm also going to show you this new cool feature here, the 3D subset selection of the point cloud. So you also can have a look in eCognition now at your point cloud, you have a few a 3D view. So that really helps to check out your data sets. You also so can change the point size. Let's go to large and inspect your data set, right? Okay, gonna close this here. This one as well. So as a first step, we're actually gonna transform our point cloud data set into a raster. And because we wanna use the raster data set in our segmentation. So, I'm going to go to the process tree. This is where you de develop your rule sets, so your workflows within eCognition. I right click and can say append new. That's going to open this window here and you can append a new process. In this case, you can choose here the algorithms that eCognition provides. There's quite a few algorithms, but in this case, I'm just going to give it a name here. So I'm going to give my rule set actually a structure with parent, so-called parent and child processes, which looks like a folder structure. And it really helps you to uh, easily understand your rule set and to uh, have a clear layout. It's uh, also more transferable if you show it to a colleague or something. So first I'm going to give our rule set a name and that's going to be forest classification. Leave all the rest empty and I've created an empty process. Now I actually can insert a child and you're going to see that this is going to be inserted into that forest classification. I'm going to call that pre-processing. In this step, actually, we will then take the point cloud data and rasterize it. To do so, um, again, right click onto this pre-processing folder here, say insert child. And now I'm actually gonna choose an algorithm. So I'm gonna look for rasterized point cloud. That's the name of the algorithm. Down here at the bottom, you have this point cloud algorithm. That's the first one, rasterized point cloud. Here, the only thing that I have to do is choose the point cloud. That's 
the name I gave the point cloud when I created the project. Then rasterize settings, point field. Here you can choose all the fields that are within the point cloud. In our case, we want to rasterize the set coordinate, so the height. I'm going to choose a kernel size of three and give the output layer a name. In our case, it's NDSM. So the point cloud was already normalized. So the elevation reflects the normalized digital surface model. And when I execute that, we will have created a new layer. I can check it in the image layer mixing. There was this button up here. And here you see all the layers that are within our project. And now you see down here, that's the layer that we've created. I'm gonna have a look at it. If it looks like expected. So what we did now is just rasterizing the point cloud based on the set coordinate. So these values here represent the height above the terrain. I'm gonna add another process here because I wanna smoothen a little bit the raster and again right click into the process tree I'm going to now choose a pen new adding a new process and i'm going to use a median filter so instead of unfolding here all the algorithms if you know how the elder algorithm is called you also can type in here the name and it will automatically filter the algorithms so i'm going to look for median filter and run this over my newly created NDSM. That's the input layer. I leave the kernel size at three. The output layer, I'm just going to overwrite my NDSM. And that's already it. And now when I execute it, if you pay attention here on the background, it looks really uh, noisy. I'm going to execute this one. And now it's smoothened a bit more, right? And that was already the first pre-processing step. And afterwards, we're going to now start with the segmentation. So we need to create initial objects to start classifying, right? So we're working in an object-based image analysis environment. And that means that we need image objects to work with. So usually in the first step, you always create, create image objects. And then you can use the features of these image objects to classify them and extract information. So to keep a nice structure, I'm um, again going to append a new process, leave the algorithm empty because I want to create a structural process. I'm going to call it segmentation. Hit OK. And I'm going to insert here our segmentation algorithm. So I right click on the segmentation, say insert child. That's going to insert a child process into the segmentation folder. And for creating image objects, we have here in the segmentation a few segmentation algorithms. I'm going to use the multi resolution segmentation. That's the most widely used segmentation algorithm, and it's really creating really nice objects. And um, I'm not going to go into detail here. I'm just going to show you which settings I'm using, what they are doing. Uh, if you're more interested, you have different. Keith's going to talk about the resources in the end where you can get additional information about the algorithms and stuff like that. So what we're going to do? So we're going to use the multi-resolution segmentation. Here are the parameters on the right-hand side that can be altered for this algorithm. Now we're going to change the level name. I want to call it level one. Uh, I always do that. So this generated image object level is called level one. Then we can define the weights of the image layers. In my case, actually, I gonna zero these out that I don't wanna use in my segmentation. And I'm gonna emphasize, you actually can increase the number here. I'm gonna emphasize the NDSM, right? So you can actually play around here a little bit with the settings. It's always going to generate different image ob objects if you change parameters here. Then the scale parameter, that's more or less defining the size of your image objects. I'm going to leave that at 10. I'm going to change the shape and the compactness. This actually 
will create more compact objects. When you create, uh, increase the compactness, you're going to have more compact objects. If you increase the shape, then uh, um, the spectral information gets ignored more or less. So if you put a really high uh, value into the shape, let's say 0 0.9, the spectral information is uh, more or less ignored. So be very careful with the shape. But we're going to use these settings here. So scale parameter 10, shape 0 0.3, compactness 0 0.8, and we're using the multi-resolution segmentation. Now I execute this one, and that should create image objects. All right. So you see here the image objects that we've created with this process here. You also can see on the bottom right actually how many image objects we've created. So in this case, a little bit more than 28,000. Okay. I'm also going to change the display here so you see the aerial image in the background. It's still there and you can overlay it with the image objects. All right. Now, after having the created the image objects, we actually can derive features from the image objects. So when you click into an object, it's highlighted in red. You can check the feature here in the image object information window. And to do so, you can go right click in here, go to select features to display. And there you have all the available features within the cognition. I'm just going to go, for example, for the mean brightness and this um, near infrared red. Geometry, we also can add the size in pixels and hit OK. And now when you click into these objects, you're going to have the information of each single object displayed here. So this has a size of 97 pixels and NDSM is 21. So it's uh, average height of this object is 21 meters. Whereas here we have zero. And this building here should have also an elevation 4.7 meters. We're going to use this information now to classify these image objects, right? So our goal is to classify forest. So how do we do that? Um, we have our data set, our data sets, the two of them, right? The RGB and near, the aerial image and the point cloud. And what we did first was rasterizing the point cloud. And now we did a segmentation, so we created image objects. And now the question is how to classify forests. So I suggest as a first step, we're going to use the NDSM, so the elevation, and we're going to discriminate elevated and non-elevated image objects. And then in the next step, we're going to have a look at the elevated classification and then start to think about how to discriminate the elevated into forests and non-forests. Okay. So let's go for the NDSM. So that makes sense. Forest has an elevation compared to grassland here, or the roads, they all should have zero. And in forested areas, we have NDSM of 6.5, for example. So we're going to use this information to do a classification of elevated and of elevated objects. That's the first step. OK, so I'm going to, again, create such a structural process. Now we have pre-process and segmentation. Next one is called classification. So I say append new and type in something here in the name called call it classification. I don't choose an algorithm, so it's more or less an empty process. Hit OK. That's the structural process. We again gonna insert a structural process in here. Call it call it elevated objects. So I, I think this is very good practice to, to structure your rule set like this. It, it's very helpful if you, let's say, in two weeks, uh, load your rule set into eCognition and you see a really nicely structured rule set instead of having uh, only processes only uh, listed here. So it, it gets really confusing, actually. So please structure your rule sets. So it makes life easier. Okay. so. We want to classify elevated objects based on the NDSM. And we're going to use an algorithm called assign class. This is going to 
assign a class to our image objects. And now a very important feature here is that here we define which algorithm we are going to use. And here we have the domain settings. And the domain defines where we're going to apply it. And the parameters here, they more or less define how. So the domain becomes now very important. So what we do at the moment, and so we use the sign class algorithm, which assigns a class to image objects. And in the domain, it says we're working on level one. That's correct. That's the level that we've created uh, in the multi-resolution segmentation. The class filter is none. That's also fine. We don't have a class yet. And in condition, we actually can now define a threshold uh, that then classifies our image objects. So we only want to classify these image objects that are higher than two meter. Um, you also could set a threshold of two, one meter, but I'm going to go for two meters and all these image objects, I'm going to put them into a class called elevated. Okay. So in this condition window, we can choose a feature and I'm going to find my feature that I want to use here in the object features, layer values, mean, and I'm going to go for the NDSM, which is the elevation, right? So I double click that one and the operator is going to be larger equal to two. So that reads all image objects that are larger than or higher than two meters or have a higher value of NDSM. And what do I want to do with them? I want to put them into a class. At the moment, it's unclassified because we don't have a class yet. So I'm just going to click OK for the moment, create a class and go back to this process, and then choose the class here and execute it. So I hit OK. It's not executed yet, but it's there in my rule set. I'm going to create a class in the class hierarchy. So if you simply right click in here, say insert class, uh, you give your class a name. In our case, it's elevated. You can choose a color for your class. I like this orange color for my elevated image object. Hit OK. And now we have our first class in our class hierarchy. If I go now back into our process, I'm simply say use class elevated. So it now assigns a class to all image objects that fulfill this condition. So I have larger NDSM than two, and they're going to be put into this class elevated. So let's see if something happens when I execute this. Yeah, nothing happened. So we have to change the view. So we're actually at the moment looking at the layer view. You can change the view here to classification. And there we go. We have a classification. So we all image objects that fulfill these conditions are now classified as elevated. Okay. So that already makes me fairly happy uh, as a first step. That looks pretty good. But as you see here, we also have buildings in our elevated class, for example. So, and here as well. So the next step, uh, uh, I want to discriminate between buildings and forests. So how could we do that? So that's the classification hierarchy. We discriminate between non-elevated and elevated based on the NDSM and we could do now, for example, discriminate forest and non-forest based on the NDVI. So the normalized difference vegetation index. And we have the formula here, near infrared. So as input data, we have near infrared layer, which is really cool if you want to classify uh, vegetation and the red layer. And we gonna use, we're gonna create actually a customized feature which represents this algorithm and call it NDVI. So we can calculate the NDVI based on image objects within eCognition. And then we're going to use this feature to discriminate between forests and non-forests. Okay, so that's actually really cool. Um, I need to remove my window here. So down here at the right, we have the feature view. I can drag it here into the center so you see it. 
And if you go to object features, customized, you actually have a chance to say, create new arithmetic feature. That's actually what we need to, uh, to create this NDVI. Okay. okay. If you double click that, you can, first of all, define a name for your arithmetic feature. I'm going to go for NDVI. And then you can input a formula here. You can use any features that are provided here and these operators. So I'm going to simply insert that formula. I'm going to use the object features near infrared minus red and divide that near plus red. Okay, so that's a well-known formula and uh, that's going to calculate the NDVI, which really helps us to discriminate then between vegetation and non-vegetated areas. I click OK and you see here we're going to have this new customized feature uh, called NDVI. And we're going to use that now to discriminate between forests and non-forests. All right, so I'm going to put that back here to the side. So where is it? Like that. So I'm going to add a new structural process here. I'm going to call it forests because we're now looking, going to look at forests. And all right, I see we have questions here. Okay, do we have questions? I see a few here in the chat. Hi, Matthias. Yeah, we have uh, a few questions here. <clears throat> One I've, uh, I've answered to the group already, but if anybody had missed this in the, the, the question dialogue, we had a, a question earlier regarding the segmentation, whether it's possible to use uh, just a single layer uh, within segmentation, or uh, do you always have to use multiple layers within segmentation? Uh, the answer is yes, you can base your segmentation off of uh, purely a single layer, even within the multi-resolution segmentation algorithm, uh, but you can also use additional algorithms, uh, segmentation algorithms available uh, and base them off of a single layer. A second question came in here, and I'll, I'll hand the, the mic back over to Matthias to answer this one, uh, regarding uh, ways to discriminate between image objects. And the question is, can we use an object uh, shape a parameter to differentiate between image objects? And uh, they're t talking about, say, uh, I'm looking for more tr uh, triangular shapes or rectangular shapes. Uh, is this possible uh, within eCognition? All right. Uh, thank you for the question. That's actually uh, more or less a core feature of eCognition because it's using this uh, object-based image analysis methodology. And if you look, have a look at the feature view, you also have this geometry folder here. And here you can address, let's say, the shape of image objects. There are a few predefined uh, features that you can use. Density, compactness, elliptic fit, roundness, rectangular fit. So you actually can use the shape of image objects for classification as well. And that is really helpful if you, for example, have image objects that have the same spectral signature, for example, a, a roof of a house and the road, but the image objects created uh, for roads, they are more lengthy. So you can use the shape to discriminate then between house, which is more rectangular, or has this rectangular fit, and the road, which is very lengthy. So very good question. That's a really cool feature in eCognition to address the shape of image objects. Okay. So again, art class hierarchy, gonna add it down here. Okay, let's go back to the classification, right? So we want to classify a forest based on the NDVI. So we're gonna again use this algorithm called assign class and use the domain again. So right now we only want to look at elevated image objects. So we don't want to have a look at a classified, unclassified image object, only the elevated. And as condition, we say, all right, 
if you have a higher NDVI, then I'm gonna go for a very small value, I think 0 0.01 or something. Um, if you're larger than that, you're gonna be put into my class forest. And that's just a shortcut that I'm gonna show you now. So instead of going into the class hierarchy, you also can type the name in here if you haven't created the class yet. Forest in this case, and then this window is gonna pop up, the class description window. I'm gonna give the forest a very bright green color, hit okay, and say execute. And now we only classified these elevated image objects that have a high NDVI into the class forest. And you see that all, or most of the buildings are still classified as elevated objects and not as forest. So that's really cool. I'm gonna add another assigned class algorithm to just kick these elevated objects into the class and classify it. So I'm just cleaning up a little bit. You actually also can use here in the process tree, uh, control C and control V for copy and paste. That also makes rules of development faster and easier. And in this case, I'm gonna delete that condition and all elevated objects that are left over I will put, put into the class unclassified. So, because we're only interested in forests, so I'm just cleaning up my classification. All right, so that looks good. Um, but we're gonna improve actually this classification. You see it, these holes, we're gonna get rid of these holes in next step. Uh, usually that's called refinement. So we're gonna refine the outlines of our image objects and improve the classification. So what I'm gonna do is it's gonna fill up these small holes here and we're also gonna refine the outline of our image objects. And we're also gonna reduce the, the number of image objects that we have in our project. So I'm gonna close these structural processes. That's also very handy if you have a nice structure in your rule set. And we're gonna start with the refinement. Refinement. And as first step in the refinement, we're gonna actually merge all forest objects together and also the unclassified. So this is more or less like a dissolve uh, in GIS, so we merge these image objects together and then work with these merged image objects afterwards. So refinement merge, I'm gonna insert a child here. That algorithm is called merge region. And now the only thing that we have to do is to set a class filter. So we wanna first merge our class forests. I'm gonna display the outline so you see what happens. So you see we have a lot of image objects here for the class forest, even though they're touching. So we're gonna clean up this one and it's gonna be a big object after executing this one. And you're also gonna see that the number of image objects is, hopefully will decrease from 28,000, okay? So I'm executing forests, boom, that's the result that one and we're going to add another one to actually merge the unclassified image objects. Okay, that looks good. And we only have 420 objects left. And in the next step, we're actually going to take care of the boundary. So we're going to smooth the boundary a little bit and we're going to use actually my favorite algorithm within it cognition called pixel-based object resizing. So I'm gonna again create a new structural process and call it reshape, because I'm gonna do add uh, reshaping algorithms here into this folder. And we're gonna look for pixel-based object resizing. And this is really cool. You can actually grow, shrink, or code your image objects and you can also define which objects you want to grow, right? So in our, our case, I wanna grow forests, right? So okay. And let's 
see we have questions, but I'm going to finish this algorithm afterwards. I'm going to hand over to Keith, who has more questions. Um, you can add different constraints. We actually, on this uh, algorithm, pixel-based object resizing, we also have a video on YouTube. Um, let's see, I have it there. Here we go. So that's our eCognition Deconstructed series started this year. So we're going to put out each month a video and you have actually two videos on this pixel-based object resizing algorithm. So if you have questions, uh, also if you don't understand what I'm doing here, uh, you can go there and afterwards you're going to understand it. It's a, there are very nice examples in these videos. Okay, and also in the videos, I also explain candidate surface tension that we're going to use now. Um, I'm just going to choose the settings, so this is going to grow. These settings will actually fill up um, these gaps in here. So it's going to smoothen the outline. The goal is to have more or less a straight line here, and it will fill up these ones here, right? Also this one, this one should vanish based on these settings. So, and I'm also, I almost forgot that, um, I'm going to set the number of cycles to three. So it's going to do the same process three times in a row. Going to execute that. Ah, and you saw it actually filled these gaps. Okay. All right, before we continue, Keith, um, I'm going to hand over to you. You have some questions, right? Yes, a few questions have, have come in uh, now. The crowd seems to be warming up. Uh, one question that we have here is regarding the rasterized point cloud algorithm. And here we use that rasterized point cloud algorithm to create our NDSM layer because this point cloud was a normalized point cloud to begin with. The question is, when we rasterize the point cloud, what is then the resolution? What is that raster cell size uh, that within the raster file that we create within eCognition? All right, so the, the, the size is defined by the project uh, uh, pixel size. Um, in my case, if I go to modify open project in this dialog, um, I loaded the raster layer, which has a resolution here that you see here of 0 0.6 uh, pixels, uh, meters. So this is going to be the, the pixel size of your project. And if you apply this, this um, algorithm, it also generates a raster file uh, with a pixel size of 0 0.6 meters in this case. Okay, are there more questions? Uh, one, one question that also came in, uh, let's say we don't have elevation data available to us, no LIDAR file, maybe no uh, DTM, DSM uh, to, to begin with. How could we use this then to differentiate between uh, forest, uh, which would then be the, our elevated vegetation in this case, and, and uh, grassland? And one way that uh, that I've seen in the past, and Matthias, you can also speak to this in just a moment, is is to use a, a simple texture. Uh, for us, is, is, a, is a much more textured um, object, uh, whereas grassland, if you look also in this image, we see some of these grasslands in comparison to the forest, they are a much smoother texture. So we can use something uh, as simple as a standard deviation to describe uh, uh, to different start to differentiate between forest and, and grassland. Will it be as say robust uh, as the height different? Uh, it will depend on, on the operating environment that you are. Uh, but this is one method that I can think of off the top of my head that uh, that could be used here. Uh, Matthias, do you have uh, maybe any other ideas that uh, that you've used in the past? Um, actually, that would have been my approach as well, but um, you also could use actually the shadow. Um, that was also an approach that I used for a project that I did. So elevated objects, also in this case, you see have a shadow, right? And in eCognition, you also can use these context features. So you could say, for example, if my object is now classified as vegetation and it has adjacent a, a shadow or a very dark area, then it must be elevated. So that could also be used for uh, discriminating between elevated vegetation and grassland, for example, right? But first I would go for the texture as well. That's a good approach. Okay, so I think we're gonna continue. Um, what we did was uh, using this pixel-based uh, 
the object resizing mode growing. So we filled gaps. And in the second step, I'm going to use shrinking. I'm going to turn this operation around. Uh, please, again, just check the videos after this, this webinar. And uh, everything that I said here is going to be explained in detail. But that's going to actually, that's going to remove all these outreaching peaks here. Right, and smoothen the outline further. Ah, what did I do? I didn't hit OK. All right, so again, shrinking. I changed it. All right, and I execute this one. Now you see we removed all these outreaching peaks. And in the final step, I simply, because the shrinking generated these small image objects, right, these unclassified now, that these were removed in the shrinking process from the forest. So I'm simply going to merge them again. And what I did, I just copied this merge uh, process and pasted it down here. So that's uh, very fast uh, rooster development. Yeah, that's because I have to speed up uh, to be able to finish uh, this rule set. So, right. So we did a reshaping. Still, I told you before that I'm going to take care of these holes here. Um, we're going to do that now. So we're actually going to address the shape of image objects in this case and also the context. Um, so we're going to use, again, a sign class and say, all right, if you are an un unclassified image object and you're fairly small, in my case, I'm going to choose, I guess, 600 pixels. So if you're smaller than 600 pixels and you're 100% surrounded by forest, you're also a forest, right? So that's just my definition. It's, it will look uh, way nicer afterwards. So let's go ahead and create this process. So I'm going to append, I'm going to create a new structural process again, call it improve classification. Classification. Okay, and I'm going to insert a child, in this case, again, a sign class. So it's it's a very simple algorithm, but very powerful because you can have all these conditions defined here, class filters and stuff. So it's a really cool algorithm. And first condition is going to be the area. So let's have a look at only image objects that are smaller than 600 pixels. So I'm going to go to object features, geometry, extent area. And I'm going to say smaller than 600. And here at new, you can actually add multiple conditions. You also have the chance to connect them with AND or OR. So you can become very fancy here. The second condition in our case, we're just going to have two. One is area, area so small, and the other one is going to be 100% uh, surrounded by the forest class. And this feature is going to be here in the class related features. And you're going to find here relations to neighbor objects. If you unfold this one, you have, have this relative border two. And that calculates actually the relative border of the object to, let's say, the class forest. Hit OK. I'm going to use this one. And if this e equals one, so if it's 100% surrounded by forest and smaller than 600 pixels, all right, it's going to be classified as forest. And a class filter, I'm only looking at unclassified image objects. So we're going to assign a class to all unclassified image objects that fulfill these two conditions, small than 600 pixels, and relative border to forest one. They're going to be put into the class forest. Let's ex execute that one. All right, nice. That looks good. So all these objects are now classified as forest. In the next step, I'm simply going to merge them together, right? So this becomes one big image object. Again, I'm going to search for my merge region process here. I'm just going to control C, copy that one, paste it here, and I'm going to execute it down here. And now we already have a very nice forest mask. One last step in the uh, refinement is going to be the removal of small forest objects. Um, because my personal definition is that a forest is only forest if it's larger than 200 pixels. Okay, And I'm going to use 
to remove these image objects that are classified as forest, I'm going to use an algorithm called remove objects. I'm going to append a new process, call it, and it's going to look for remove. Let's say remove objects. That's it. And what I want to do is in the class filter, I'm only want to remove forest, right? I'm going to look, we are looking at a forest class and the condition is now we again going to choose, uh, look for the area. So geometry extent area. And if that forest object is smaller or equal to 200 pixels, that's the unit, it's going to dissolve into its surrounding class, more or less. Okay. You have further parameters here. We're going to leave that default. And when I execute that, all these small objects should vanish. All right. They are gone. So now the smallest uh, image object classified as forest is 201 pixels. Okay. And that already looks pretty nice, I would say. So let's check our classification for the forest. We have this option here to split our view. Uh, I really love to use that uh, to check if my classification is good or not good. And we have this swipe view. And now you can uh, change the view settings in each pane. I'm just going to display here our aerial image and down here the classification and use the swipe tool. And that looks, it's not perfect, right? But it looks all right. So I'm happy with it. That looks good. Okay. So we're actually done with the forest classification, but our objectives were that we also discriminate into different height classes, right? So that's going to be our last step. Um, we did this is our uh, classification tree more or less. We split it at the beginning elevated, non-elevated, based on the NDSM, so on the elevation of the features. Then we calculated the NDVI to discriminate between more or less houses and vegetation. And in the last step, we're going to discriminate different high classes within the class forest. And we again, of course, going to use the NDSM. And we're going to discriminate into these five classes. It's lower than five meters. 5 to 10, 10 to 15, 15 to 20, and higher than 20 meters. And I'm going to show you a very nice algorithm uh, called multi-threshold segmentation, which does that in one step. So let's go for the last steps. I'm going to add a new structure process, call it classification 2, classification Two. And I'm going to insert a child and call, and I'm lo looking for a segmentation algorithm called multi threshold segmentation. Now we're going to work instead of when we use the multi resolution segmentation, we're in domain pixel level, but we already have an image object level and we want to only do a segmentation within our forest class. So we're going to choose here image object level. And then here, we can set as class filter our class forest. And now the segmentation only will take place into the in the class forests. And now there was also a question in the beginning, right? In this case, this algorithm also only allows to use one layer. And we're going to use the NDSM, right? So we're going to do the multi-threshold segmentation only on one layer. We also can define a minimum object size that is generated. I'm going to go for 25. So we do not have uh, image objects that are just uh, one pixel in size. And then down here, we have the different thresholds that we set. So the first threshold is going to be five meters, OK? The second one, 10, then 15, then 20. And now how you read that, so class one, all image objects that fall or fall under the threshold of five going to be classified as, in our case, smaller than five meters. 
Okay. Gonna give that class a, a dark green color. Hit OK. And then next one, it's a threshold five, between five and 10, all these image objects are gonna be classified into the class 10, five to 10 meters. Let's give that also green color, then 10 to 15. So it has to be in ascending order, right? Um, these thresholds, and that one is 15 to 20 meters. And let's go bright. Uh, and the brightest glass is gonna be higher than 20 meters. Okay, so larger than 20 meters. Gonna give it a very bright color. It's that, that's very bright, or something like that. Okay, and now when I execute that one, it's gonna split my forest object into these different classes based on solely the NDSM, okay? So that's a really cool way to do a segmentation and classification in one step. Let's execute that, and that's the result. So what you see is that we split up our forest class into different canopy heights. Okay, let's display the outline. And then that was just one line of, that was just one process within eCognition. And that's our final goal. So we did actually create, so that was our game plan, starting with the data, discriminating elevated, non-elevated, then forest, non-forest, and then splitting this forest class up into different classes, different height classes. And the final step would be the export. So gonna create a new structural process here, then insert a child, and if you look for export, you have a lot of different export algorithms. You can export rasters, uh, screenshots, statistics, and also point clouds, or whatever. In this case, we're going to export vector layer. And here you can choose, for example, shape type points, polygons, lines. In our case, polygons would make sense. And what else? You can define the name, of course, and also the attributes that you want to export. So you have, can choose any attributes, as many as you want here in from the list. Okay, mean, let's export that one. Okay, and executing this will produce a shapefile that you then can use in another GIS system or something, or you could use export raster and that would be your final result here. Okay, what I did here was uh, I created first a subset. I also applied it on the whole image. So I took that rule set and applied it on the whole image and classified my whole scene. So it also makes sense to develop your rule set in a small subset, so everything is very fast. And afterwards, go to your larger data set and execute your rule set there. And the result looks really cool. Okay. So that's all I wanted to show. Um, Peter, I think it's time for you to take over, right? For the last part of the presentation. have a, a few more questions that came in, Matthias. Um, one is is from uh, from our, our group of listeners in, in Latin America. Um, they were just asking if you could just review those uh, those chapters of the rule set uh, that you created. Just uh, just do a basic review of, of what each one of these chapters was dedicated to without uh, without going into too much detail and 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 executing them again just just review what uh, what we were trying to do within each chapter of, of that rule set that you created okay so I'm just gonna delete, delete everything here again um, what we did in the first part was simply uh, rasterizing our point cloud because I want to use uh, this information into the segmentation process. Therefore, I created a raster based on the elevation information of the point cloud that was done here, the raster. 
creation. And then that's actually the, the principal workflow in, in e-cognition that you do a segmentation, classification, you refine your image objects, and then you export your results, right? Segmentation, we use the multi-resolution segmentation. You can play around with the settings. Um, I want to have more compact objects. That's why, that's why I increased the compactness here. You also could create smaller image objects or larger ones. It depends on the purpose of your classification and um, what you want to have, right? Then the classification was first discriminating elevated and non-elevated objects based on the NDSM information. I'm going to execute them. So you see, also have, see what I'm talking about. So first one was creating new image objects. Then these are all unclassified. I classified the elevated ones here now in orange. Then in the next step, I discriminated forests and buildings that are both elevated based on the NDVI that we calculated as a customized feature. Then I started with the refinement. First was merging. So I have a lot of image objects here that I don't need in my case for the refinement. So I merge them together, right? That was first step. Then reshaping was taking care of this outline, right? So let's have a detailed look at this outline and I'm going to execute the whole thing. That's also an advantage of structuring the rule set, right? You can now execute this folder and it's going to execute all the processes that are stored within this reshape folder uh, step by step. So that's very helpful as well. So take a look at the line here, forest outline. I want to smooth it, improve it, and that's the result of my reshape uh, procedures. Then finally, I removed or I included these small gaps in the forest into the class forest and also removed very small forested areas. Um, I actually don't know what the de definition of forest is based on the size. Or well, if two trees are already forests, uh, I don't think so. So I applied this one for improvement. So we filled the gaps and removed small forest objects. And then finally, classification two is simply looking at a class forest and discriminating based on heights uh, into different height class of the forest. And I use the multi-threshold segmentation to do so. I'm gonna execute that and you're gonna end up with something like this. So we have here the class higher than 20 meters, here it's lower than five meters, right? Solely based on one layer, the NDSM that we've calculated based on the point cloud data set that we've loaded. And usually as a last step, you want to export your results to show it as a raster, the classification or shapefile or statistics, the area of classified forest project statistics and stuff like that. So that's usually the last step to export your results. Okay, Keith, other questions? Uh, so getting a, a few questions uh, that keep on uh, coming in here. Uh, one would uh, one that came in is uh, we saw the referenced in, in the, the object domains and stuff was this concept of of levels. What are these uh, levels and how do they correspond to image objects? So when we create image objects in eCognition through say a segmentation, uh, these seg these objects need to be stored somewhere, and we store these objects in what we call an image object level. And image object levels, for example, can very simply be used to, to store our image objects at various uh, steps within our rule set. So if we're in development and we want to uh, experiment uh, and we create our initial segmentation, we then want to do a classification, but I don't want to necessarily overwrite the initial image objects that I have with, with this classification. I can create an, an image object level and then do my classification in that in a particular image object level without affecting the objects in, the, in that initial level. That would probably be the most simple example of where we can use image object levels. If we go beyond that, we can store objects at, uh, that represent uh, maybe various stages of a class or different classifications. 
for example, uh, when we're working multi-temporally, we can store the different uh, multi-temporal classification results in different levels. And then we can communicate between the, the objects in those levels. And by this, we can compare the object at level uh, maybe 2010 to the object that is now uh, in its current state in 2018. And if we see a change in the classification, then we can identify that object as a uh, as having a, a change uh, that occurred in during at some point during that time period. So there are many different ways you can use uh, levels within your within your uh, rule set. Um, another uh, question came in here is can you use eCognition to leverage a training data? Uh, by this, uh, I think what is meant can we uh, train uh, eCognition? Uh, based on, on, on an outside tour, uh, training data source, let's say maybe you have GPS ground truth of, uh, of a certain land cover, can you use this data to train a classifier uh, within eCognition? Uh, again, uh, let me just uh, uh, answer some of these questions. So what we've seen in this uh, webinar is an example of what we call knowledge-based classification. The developer, in this case Matthias, he is defining the class definitions based on his expert knowledge of remote sensing of, of this particular image of the classification results that, uh, that are desired. It is also possible to do supervised classification with any cognition, which then would require such training data sets. And these training data sets can be created fully within eCognition. You can also import training data sets from a shapefile source uh, to, to use an eCognition to train uh, that classifier model on, on what, to, uh, what to look for. Another um, question here, can you expand the rule set so I can get a screenshot? Uh, one, one viewer is, is asking. Um, yes, uh, Matthias, uh, feel free to, uh, to, to expand, uh, expand the rule set. You can definitely take a screenshot. Do remember though, the webinar is recorded so you can go back and reference this uh, at any time uh, you like uh, after, after the fact and uh, just kind of, it will be available on the Trimble Geospatial webinar archive. So you can, if you miss something, if we went a little too fast somewhere, don't worry, you can go back and, and reference the recording uh, to get, uh, get those answers. Let's see, another question came in here. Uh, can I perform a curacy assessment for a classified image uh, from a different uh, image levels? Um, you, there are accuracy assessment tools available within eCognition Developer. Uh, for this, uh, I think we're gonna talk about the resources in just a few moments. Um, I can point you to the direction of where you can find a tutorial that will cover accuracy assessment uh, within eCognition uh, and that, that will uh, definitely um, uh, show you how to do this, then you'll get demonstration data, rule sets that, that, that you can use to, to base your, um, your work off of. So I'm going to now uh, take back over the, the role of, of presenter here, and I will show the, the, the last few uh, slides we have in today's uh, webinar based on our eCognition resources. So again, uh, this, this webinar has covered a lot of material, especially the exercise, a lot of nice algorithms being touched upon. Um, where, do I, where do I go maybe from here um, if I'm a new eCognition user? Uh, where can I uh, get more information to uh, speed up the, the learning process of, of the software? So we have a number of different resources available. There are guided tours and tutorials, uh, YouTube videos that Matthias has already uh, mentioned, uh, of course, our webinar series, and we also have several blogs uh, that, uh, that can, uh, can be subscribed to. And all of this is, is free uh, material for you to use in, in learning, and you can reference these as often as you want. And uh, you can also uh, use uh, the blogs to communicate with us if you have questions. Guided tours and tutorials, uh, these are hosted in the eCognition community. Again, this is a free user community. I believe we're over uh, 15,000 registered uh, accounts in, in this community. Uh, so it's a great place uh, for a dialogue, exchange, asking questions, uh, with other users, with, uh, with, with our staff, of course, that, uh, that are active in the community. You have three guided tours. These will introduce you to various functionality within eCognition. One looks an at an example of, of what we call simple building extraction. 
We then have a one that looks at impervious surface mapping and then uh, more advanced techniques for, for building extraction. Uh, don't think about these for as, as a way of finding out how to do it necessarily a specific task, but you will also see general workflows covered here so you can get a better understanding of how rule sets are created and managed uh, within the software. In addition, we have seven tutorials available within the cognition uh, community. Here, everything from working with regions or maps, these are concepts that, uh, that will be introduced within the tutorial. So if there are four now, please uh, go to these tutorials. You can simply search tutorials uh, within the cognition community and, and go through the listing here. We have uh, analyzing regions of interest, working with uh, LIDAR uh, data, um, and also here again, using sample statistics. This is, the, uh, this is again, that exercise that will also look at um, the accuracy assessment within eCognition. Also, Something that's uh, very interesting uh, and, and new in, in eCognition 9.3 uh, is deep learning. There are tools for uh, conducting deep learning. Uh, we use the Google TensorFlow uh, system within within eCognition, and you will find the tutorials of how to work in deep learning uh, to to um, work through this without having to uh, get bogged down and say programming all that Python script yourself. In addition, then working with point clouds. So if there are more of you interested in specific point cloud questions, I, I would encourage you to to uh, take a look at uh, that, that, uh, that tutorial as well. All of the tutorials come with step-by-step -step PDFs uh, as well as uh, data uh, to, to work on. Yes, uh, the YouTube channel. So if Trimble Geospatial has a YouTube channel within that, there is a specific uh, section for, for eCognition. This is where we host our eCognition deconstructed uh, videos. We, uh, since the beginning of the year, have been uh, publishing a, a monthly video. Uh, these uh, focus on specific algorithms. Uh, some of them are, uh, some of them, like Matthias said, are broken up into two parts. So we try and keep this under 15 minutes. Uh, so you can go in and uh, and subscribe to this. You all then get the the latest video. So you can see we've covered multi-threshold segmentation. We've covered the pixel-based object resizing algorithm, uh, layer arithmetics. Um, Cutting out shape files, I believe, is also um, a video here. Uh, so just uh, stay stay tuned here, and you'll get the the tips and tricks. Not only how does how do the parameters work within an algorithm, but we also show use cases. How could you use this in uh, in, in the real world? We also have uh, some blogs, and these are in the form of the <clears throat> eCognition group. Uh, this is hosted in uh, LinkedIn at the moment. Uh, we have, and as a part of this uh, LinkedIn uh, group, we have what we call the eCognition Brainwave. This is a weekly tip uh, that we what we put out, and these are, are, are pretty specific uh, to, to solving and maybe making life easier in certain areas. So please, uh, again, you can sign up to this this group. It's free. Uh, you then get all this information. You also get uh, notified uh, via the group of, of news and uh, say, what we call hot topics, what's going on with the eCognition team. Um, and and, and whatnot within the, this group, and uh, again, free for, for all to, to use. Beyond this, uh, we also have uh, case studies. There's a whole host of case studies. So if you're looking for more examples of uh, how, how eCognition has been used by other other folks out there, maybe inspiration how uh, your organi organization can, can also leverage eCognition, you can uh, access these, uh, the, the, the Trimble Geospatial Customer Stories Portal. Here's the address. Uh, you can download these PDF documents and, and read through the highlights of uh, what's going on uh, with, with other eCognition users out and around the world. Yes, uh, we have the, the webinar series, as you are uh, fully aware if you're attending this. Uh, this is through the Trimble Geospatial Web Webinar Portal. Uh, you'll see a number of Trimble topics covered here, not just eCognition. You also see things like Trimble Business Center also does a, uh, a pretty frequent monthly webinar, power hours, things like that. So we have three different general categories here. Uh, starting point, uh, like today, where we're, we're introducing uh, some new topics to, to newer users, uh, if you will. We have a section on Elevate Your Skills here. We are also hearing how some of our partners use eCognition. You'll see a, a whole bunch of these uh, within, within our uh, 
our uh, webinar series. And we also have the Power Hour where we really tackle uh, some, some maybe some complex uh, specific topics within eCognition. So we've been touching upon uh, something in this in each category. Uh, we typically try and do this once a month. Uh, so you'll see these notifications. And uh, again, it's free. You can just sign up and register, attend live, or uh, then access the recordings afterwards. And I said, uh, maybe finally, just uh, before we wrap up, I will field a few more questions that, that have come in in the meantime. But uh, other eCognition resources, we have eCognition training. Um, and we have several upcoming training events uh, in the calendar this year. We have an open training event uh, that will be taking place in Berkeley, California. Here, this uh, date has been finalized. It will be between August 14th and 16th. Um, if you have... Uh, the energy and uh, the interest to to attend this event. It will be a very uh, uh, good several days, really getting to your hands into eCognition, um, also interacting directly with our trainer, Matthias, and uh, getting all those questions answered in, in all the detail you like. For European customers, we have a training coming up, uh, or we're currently scheduling this in the UK. This will take place at some point in early September 2018. Uh, at the moment, we're, we're still working to finalize the location and date for that, and, and we will make the notifications of this uh, once, once everything is, is completely final. So, uh, can take a few more minutes uh, to answer some of the questions uh, that have come in here. Uh, let's see what do we have. Uh, one question, what is the automation capability of this process? Uh, so in, in this uh, webinar, we created a rule set and uh, we, I think at, at the very end of it, Matthias uh, showed very nicely, he then took this rule set that was maybe developed on a, on a subset of the data um, which is very efficient. You don't have to wait for large data sets to process. But uh, we then transferred this, this uh, to the entire image or to a, an entire uh, stack of images. So the automation capabilities of the process will uh, depend on several factors. A, uh, how much automation you want within the project, it's, it's flexible here, and how much automation is even uh, possible to, to solve a problem. You know, not every uh, problem, image analysis problem can be fully automated, uh, but we can provide a, a, a wide range of, of semi-automation to this. This particular algorithm, uh, this process that we created, this rule set, this will run completely automatically. All we have to do is bring in the next image from this, uh, from this mosaic uh, and click execute, and it will then automatically run on, on this. Or even better, we bring in a whole series of, of images from our mosaic and we queue these up in eCognition server and send them in batch uh, to, for processing. Let's see, what else um, came in here during the meantime? Is there an archive of rule sets uh, developed by other users which can be used as a starting point or examples to look at? Uh, excellent question. Uh, yes, uh, there are rule sets available. Again, the eCognition community is a great uh, place to start looking here. Uh, you will see uh, the rule set files. These are stored as DCP files. You can download these. Some of the rule sets have been loaded by, uh, uploaded by users, some of them by our eCognition engineers, and you are free to use any rule set in the community uh, for your needs. Take note, though, that uh, these rule sets were developed maybe on a, on a particular set of imagery. So a rule set that was developed uh, based on Landsat may not you work one-to-one -one on uh, Sentinel data. Um, so you may uh, get the uh, the rough outline of what you want to do with the rule set and then just adjust the parameters to, to meet the needs of, of your data. So yes, there are uh, pieces like this available out there. So that being said, I'd uh, like to move on to our final slide here and just thank you for attending this webinar. We went a little bit over the, the one hour, so thank you for bearing with me. And with uh, Matthias, uh, again, uh, my name is Keith Peterson. I'm the product manager here uh, at eCognition. Uh, Matthias is our technical support engineer or one of our technical support engineers. And I would say if you have any questions that we uh, just didn't get to uh, in this webinar due to time, please feel free to contact us at support at ecognition.com and our engineers uh, will get back to you uh, and answer that question. So 
Thank you for attending today. I hope you enjoyed this webinar and stay tuned uh, for the, our upcoming webinars uh, next month and also any events that we have coming up uh, in the next month. Uh, if anybody will be attending the GOBIA 2018 in, uh, in Montpellier, France, our staff will be there as well. So you can also approach us at the GOBIA where we will also be conducting um, many hackathons and uh, and you can approach us and uh, we will try and solve your problem within the, the allotted time at the GOBS. So another great opportunity that's coming up to, to mingle with our engineers and uh, myself for this. So again, thank you for attending and we will see you next time.